there. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel 14. If you've been around being a Christian or being around the church long enough, you'll realize that there are pithy statements sometimes that are made, a a kind of statements that may have some truth to it, some reality to it, but but they get... uh, they're, they're not nuanced enough, maybe, to explain the whole. One of those is Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Have you heard that one? I get why it came about. Uh, there is an important reason that we'll get to why I think that statement came about. But, but it's not really a totally true statement. Because, because Christianity is a religion if we understand what religion is. Is The word religion itself simply means a group of people adhering to a particular set of beliefs and practices out of a belief in a, and a worship of a superhuman power or powers. In other words, religion is just uh, what you decide to do, what you believe, and how you practice that belief in any context. In fact, uh, it doesn't have to be organized religion. Every single person is actually religious. Every person has a, a set of beliefs that they adhere to and why they make decisions, even if they can't explain it. In fact, even atheists, those who believe there, are, there is no God, it is a religious expression of faith. That faith statement is there is no God. All, all of a sudden, you are now practicing something that you believe to be true. Every single person worships. That is the core of who we are, is that that we worship something. Even if you say, no, I don't worship anything, you're either worshiping the creation that God created, you're worshiping the creator, or where most people boil down to is what what do they end up worshiping? They worship themselves, the thing they value the most. I think why the statement Christianity is a is not a religion, it's a relationship came about is because of how religion gets used. How religion becomes religiosity. It becomes just this practice where people do things, they go through the motions, but they don't actually believe it. They actually view religion as a way of appeasing whatever God they believe is there. They, they engage in some kind of quid pro quo. If they believe God is, is there, that if they do enough, if they satisfy that God, then that God will do what they want it to do. So it's just this cosmic game of going through the motions. And if I do enough, then that, that deity will be satisfied. It's really what we're going to talk about this morning, the difference between convictional faith and religious practice, religious going through the motions. And we're going to talk about two individuals in that. Now, as we come back to this uh, narrative in 1 Samuel, I realize that why sometimes we'll backtrack a little bit, I realize not everyone's here every week and it's easy to get missed in the narrative, but we come back to 1 Samuel, we remember that where we're at in the narrative, in the history of Israel, Israel is in just a sad state of affairs. Which, by the way, if you study Israel's history, aren't they most times in a sad state of affairs? Like, there's only a few, like, chapters where, like, everything's good, everything's great, they're trusting the Lord, and when they trust the Lord, things went well, but when they didn't, it was bad. So Israel, in the Old Testament, when they came into the Promised Land, they possessed all the God-given resources necessary to thrive as God's set-apart people. But even though they possessed all these resources, they continually would rebel. They would turn away from God toward culture around them, seeking satisfaction with those things that they could see around them. When they did that, they'd become oppressed and finally call out for deliverance. We started back in chapter 8, where you remember that after the uh, judgment time or the priesthood of Samuel, the people called for a king, even though God was their king. And when they called for a king, God says, you don't want a king? They said, we want a king. God says, fine, I'll give you a king, and I'm going to give you a king that you want according to your standards, but not the one you need and not the one that measures up to mine. He looked the part, but lacked the character, leading to a continual state 
of unsettled status. So, so during this reign of Saul, you just have Israel being unsettled. Uh, they're, they're ping-ponging. They, they're, they just don't have clear direction, and they're not thriving, although God's gracious hand is staying them in the land. Remember, this is how God set it up. If, if you understand the geography of Israel, God has set up Israel in the land. He goes, my perfect plan is I'm going to bring my people back in the land, and I'm going to place them in the middle of all their enemies. In, in this point, right, who did you have toward the coast? Israel set up here. Who's on the coast? The Philistines. Who was to the east? The Moabites, the Ammonites. You had the, uh, in, the in the future, you're going to have the Assyrians and the Babylonians come from the north. To the south were the Egyptians. In other words, they're in the middle of all their enemies. Still today, where Israel exists is in the midst of people who want to drive them into the sea. Now, by the way, is that much different than how we live today? Are we surrounded by people who are against what we believe and against what God wants? Yeah, for sure. We, we feel like strangers and foreigners in the land. But for Israel, what it required then, if you are placed perfectly set by God to be in the midst of all your enemies, what did that mean? That meant they could never let down their guard. They could never stop trusting the Lord. And whenever they did, the enemies were knocking at the door. It required Israel to always, always, always serve and, and follow the Lord. So, even in the midst of that, we see this narrative of Saul uh, in what we see in the, uh, in the history of Israel is quite frankly the same way we live today. God is committed to accomplishing his glory and will through his chosen people. But he will levy consequences when there's disobedience. He'll forgive sin and will exercise his sovereign goodness in our lives. Just one more step back. I just want us to remember why studying the Old Testament is so important. Why is Old Testament narrative so important? I think sometimes we get caught up into thinking that the Old Testament are just a story of morals. That we come away saying, well, I should obey and not disobey, and I should do this and not do this, and we, we miss the whole picture. Remember what God is doing in Israel. What God is doing is even through this asking for a king that God is bringing history to a climax. He brought Israel into the land of promise so that they could have a temple, so that they can worship and bring glory to God and shine brightly to all the nations around them, that they would thrive there. And yet we see that, that they, they're brought into the land, they have a king, they're going to have about 100 years or less of united monarchy. That's going to lead them to this divided monarchy after Solomon. You remember after Solomon, it went David, or Saul, David, Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom split north and south. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. And in the divided monarchy, that lasted for a, a, a couple hundred years or, or less. Then in 722 BC, the Assyrians took away the northern kingdom and crushed them. In 586 BC, the Babylonians took Israel, the rest of Judah, into captivity. That's where you find a lot of the rest of the Old Testament prophecies is Israel in captivity. And all along this path in captivity, you think, where is God in all of this? Why did God move back or turn his back on his promises, and the whole Old Testament leads to this culmination that God has not forgotten Israel, and they actually had a king come to the temple once again. When we celebrate Christmas in a few months, we celebrate the culmination of the Old Testament was the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came to his temple, he offered himself back to his people Israel, and more than that, as they rejected him, he offers himself to us as our king and savior and Lord. And, the, and what we learn about the Old Testament is God follows through on his commands, he follows through on his promises, and not only at Christmas time, we look forward to the time where Christ will come back to his temple and reign once again and will reign with him. So there's, there's this bigger picture of history that we're studying, not only in the past, but something still to come into the future. So all that said, what we discover, here's what, coming back to, I wanna talk about 1 Samuel 13, what we talked about last week. By the way, anybody come with a flashlight this week? Just in case. 
Thank you, whoever, whoever took out that transformer, man, made a really good point. Thank you. This is good. So we had the power outage last week. We powered through. By the way, so proud of you guys. No one freaked out. No one rushed to the doors except to open them, and we finished up. So if the power goes out again, we're just going to keep going. Amen and amen? All right. So here, actually, 1 Samuel 13 and 14 is one long narrative. It's one, uh, one story told in three parts. And, and it compares and contrasts what we're going to look at today, the fearful foolishness of Saul. The fearful foolishness of Saul as he practices religiosity, where he has religion but no relationship. You see that in three, in three episodes of Saul, and that's juxtaposed, it's compared and contrasted with the relentless fearlessness of his son, Jonathan. So, so these three stories in one narrative, you're going to take a look at, here's what Saul did, and here's what his son, Jonathan, did, and we're going to take away from Jonathan as an example of relentless faith. Jonathan lived by faith where Saul functioned in misplaced religiosity. Jonathan acted like a true king where Saul only posed as one. Jonathan lived by conviction where Saul tried to leverage religion to his own benefit. Jonathan was willing to live and die for the glory of God, where Saul tried to leverage religion, oh, nope, Saul tried to use God so that he wouldn't die. Jonathan shows us a pathway of how saving faith operates, where Saul shows us what an almost faith looks like, or what man-centered religion looks like. Before we get into the details, because we're going to be pressed for time, I'm going to summarize a lot of these stories. We had three stories. Last week, we looked at how Saul made a foolish sacrifice. You remember that? Jonathan started to scrap with the Philistines. The Philistines didn't like that. They surrounded Saul. Saul couldn't wait the full seven days, and he offered a foolish sacrifice, practicing religion, trying to appease God before Samuel came, because Samuel should have made that sacrifice. You see Jonathan's faithfulness, Saul's folly. We're going to take a look at the first narrative in chapter 14, where Sam, uh, Saul is going to make a foolish vow after Jonathan secured a victory against the Philistines. Uh, Saul makes a foolish vow saying, no one is going to eat anything until we finish the job. Dumb. And he clutches, what is that word? He clutches defeat out of the hands of victory. He snatches defeat out of the hands of victory. And then we're going to take a look at the end of chapter 14, where Saul makes a foolish decision in front of everybody to put his own son to death because he violated the vow that Saul had made and the people actually intervene. Why is it important to see these three story arcs as repeating really the same theme and issue? Because Jonathan had become the savior of Israel in human terms and the one who actively trusted the Lord. Though Jonathan himself would never rule or become king, even though he had the character to do it, he actually wouldn't become king because of his dad's foolishness. He actually paves a pathway to follow in terms of relentless faith in the midst of foolish disobedience. So we're going to see this vivid contrast in this text between religious folly and relentless Faith. That's where we're going to go. Relentless faith versus religious folly. Let's, let's go now to chapter 14, and we'll read uh, the first five verses. I'm not going to read every uh, text here, but I think here we're going to see relentless faith moves and acts on conviction. You'll remember again, here, here is uh, Israel surrounded by the Philistines. If you go back to chapter 13, 23, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now, this is not a moral for junior high or high school kids. Don't tell your, tell your parents stuff before you go to war. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate grove at Migron. 
And the people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah. Now, listen, Ahijah doesn't necessarily mean anything to you, but listen to this description of Ahijah. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, that should ring a bell. Son of Phinehas, that should ring a bell. Son of Eli, that should ring a bell. The priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of one was Boses, and the name of the other was Senna. And the one crag rose on the north side uh, in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Now, here's what I love about Old Testament history is you get these funny names and these funny places and these funny uh, geographical positions. But, But here's what we understand about this, right? Israel was in a bleak scenario. Again, at the conclusion of chapter 13, The standing army was sent home and Saul was left with 600 men and they were in Gibeah. And all around in Michmash was was the main battalion of the Philistines. Uh, They began to send out raiders from there. We're going to read is that that they were just just biding their time. The Philistines were surrounding them and laying siege. Now, I want to show a quick couple of things because you're thinking, In our minds, you're like, well, why didn't the Philistines that were surrounding them just wipe them out? According to chapter 13, who remembers how many, what did the text describe? How many Philistine soldiers were there? A lot. Like multitudes, sand of the seashore kind of thing. If you remember that, you should read your Bibles. Anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know you do. I'm sure you you did this morning. Uh, I want to show, and I, by the way, a couple weeks ago, I blamed our, our fine I, uh, people up in the booth. It was my fault that this didn't advance. Here's what I want to show you. This is, this is the land of Israel uh, in this area. It's not flat. It's not, it's not like on these big plains. It's, it's not these big wide open areas. These are craggy. I mean, it's hard to see the elevation, but these things are called wadis, when I was in Israel, I, I uh, studied at Israel for a semester. We used to hike these wadis, and, and, and each side there's these cliffs, and during parts of the year there would be standing water in some parts, and, and these were hard things to traverse. This is in a different part of the year. This is actually uh, the wadi that, that we're talking about in the story. You can see where you would have on one side one group and on another side the other group, so you just couldn't quickly and easily send an army through this, this ravine. And if you try to scale these walls, uh, the other army would stand there and go, okay, thank you, bink, you're dead. Bink, you're dead, right? I mean, it's like you just couldn't do it. And so, so what the Philistines were doing at Michmash is they're just biding their time and waiting for Israel to come out. And here you have, uh, this is a different, uh, so you have Boses and Senna, uh, where where uh, this is the wadi that, that Jonathan's going to come through, Jonathan's going to attack here, and this is where they normally would have to go because that was passable. And lastly, here is a modern day version. So this is, uh, this is where probably where Jonathan would have scaled these walls here into Michmash from this other side instead of coming here where they would have expected. All right, that's a quick little version of that. So you have to understand, so, and, and you understand at the end of chapter 13, here's what else Israel had against them, is they had no weaponry. At the end of chapter 13, it said they didn't have swords and spears, they had to turn all their plowshares and their farming equipment, they had to sharpen them, they actually had to find blacksmiths from the Philistines to sharpen their weaponry. They had every advantage go, or disadvantage going against them. So in this scenario, we find Saul. Saul is now on this side. He's waiting for the Philistines. And as he's waiting, it says he's just sitting under a pomegranate cave or a pomegranate orchard in Gibeah. He's just chilling. He's waiting. But what's fascinating is the text says he's not just waiting alone. The 600 are with him, but he's waiting with Ahijah. 
who is the priest. Now, now I, I said, remember this description of the priest. He was in the line of Ichabod, which was in the line of Phineas, which was in the line of Eli. Anybody real quickly remember what happened to Eli's line of priesthood? It got what? Yeah, yeah, it was rejected. It was rejected, and, and all of a sudden now they had this, they had this priestly garb. He was wearing the ephod. They did priestly things, but God had rejected them. So you have a rejected priestly line with a rejected king waiting. And in that, they were still going through motions, but what was true of both the priest and the king at this point? They were not hearing the word of the Lord. God was not speaking to them. He had rejected them. What we're going to see with Saul throughout is Saul's going to practice religious things with no power, with no conviction. He was going to go through the motions. He did what so many people do today. They play church. They placate the Lord, thinking that's going to please him somehow. And God says, I hate it. I hate it. In this scenario, you have Saul waiting, and now you have his son Jonathan, who we're introduced to, not just as a warrior, but of a man of great faith. And so Jonathan hatches the plan as he decides to move forward. Why? Because faith always moves. Faith is willing to stand alone. This was Jonathan. Jonathan alone took a step of faith. But faith rarely stays alone. And so Jonathan took his armor bearer, and it's, it's fascinating to me that his armor bearer didn't need much convi- convincing. I believe that Jonathan was a man of faith, and it's a lot easier to follow a man of faith, a person of faith, than somebody who lacks conviction. And so Jonathan's courage was produced by a convictional faith. He didn't tell his father, most likely because he knew his dad. If Jonathan would have gone up and and told his dad his plan, his dad would have said, don't do it, son. Just wait here. We got to wait for something else to happen. And what was the plan? These two bold soldiers would scale the sides of the wadi. Now, one side was called Bozes. And uh, man, I mean, mean, this close. If Morgan had been a boy, Bozes was like, it was in the the running. Uh, Bozes means slippery. Uh, Senna means thorny. Those are very descriptive, right? So slippery and thorny. In other words, this was not a very easily passable climb. This would have been climbing a sheer wall that was both slippery and thorny. I don't, I like hiking, but I don't really like climbing, and I like climbing less if I know I'm going to slip and fall and get cut up by thorns in doing that. There's reasons why people didn't climb up this area. But this was, this was Jonathan's plan. This was, showed his faith. These would have been, uh, this would not have been guarded because no one, no one would have tried to climb them. But Jonathan was convinced that faith demanded action. It was one thing to believe that God would deliver. It's one thing to believe God is sovereign. It's another thing to act on that knowledge that he will deliver and that he is sovereign. Jonathan was willing to move and to risk. But the question is, at this point of the story, I think if the story ended here, you would think, okay, is Jonathan just an impetuous youth? Is he, just, is he just a punky young guy who thinks he's, he's indestructible, right? You remember when you were a teenager, some of you are, that you go, man, I will never die, I'll never get in an accident, I am indestructible. You remember that? How long did that last? Yeah, till you get your knee replaced. Huh? Yeah, baby, okay. Uh, you, that doesn't last very long. So is Jonathan just impetuous? Is he trying to make a name for himself? Is he, is he just a, a bratty, punky young guy? If the story ended now, maybe that would be the case, but it's clearly not, because the story goes on. Starting in verse 6, relentless faith does not presume on God. Relentless faith does not presume on God and his sovereignty. We wrestle with the tension of trusting God's sovereignty and taking action, right? There's this tension of like, God's in control. He's going to do, accomplish his will. He's going to do it, but he calls us into action to be obedient, right? And and I say tension uh, on purpose. There should always be a tension of these two realities. 
Not even a balance. It's living in tension. It should be taught. Trusting God's sovereignty without action misunderstands that God works and gets the glory, but calls his people to act by faith obediently. God's sovereignty never says, just stay put, just sit on the couch, I'm gonna accomplish everything through you. That's not how it works. However, acting without trusting God's sovereignty reveals that we think we are God, that we can fix things. And that way we ultimately get glory for ourselves. So when we detach the glory of God or detach the sovereignty of God, we put too much onus and responsibility on ourselves and we try to fix things and do it on our own. And when we get jammed up, that's when we call out for help. So there's this tension of acting but trusting. Here, Jonathan demonstrated the beauty of living out this tension, differentiating himself from the apathetic sitters to faith-driven movers. Now, I love this story. The story goes like this, is, and I think the story is pretty fantastic, but we get desensitized because we've seen too many movies. Oh, you can't see too many movies. I take that back. Anyway, but, but by the movies we watch, right? Here's how Hollywood depicts action stars and action movies, right? Uh, is that the, the star, the hero goes into a room and he, and he t- dispatches like 50 people and he gets hit a hundred times and he walks out without any blood or blemish. And then at the end of the movie, he's, he, he gets the girl, he kisses the girl and he's like, he's unstained. I'm like, man, like I was doing yard work yesterday and I bent wrong and my back is sore. Like, like, I think we just, we just put these things and we get desensitized. This. Here was Jonathan and here's what he did. He climbs up the thorny, slippery, craggy thing. He gets up there and he goes, probably hearkening back to what he remembered about Gideon in the days of the judges. And he goes, look, God, here's, here's, here's what I'd like. I'm going to get up there. And if I get up to the top of this thing and I see the Philistines off and they say, they say, come up here. I know you've given them into my hand. And if they say, wait, we'll come down to you, the jig is up. Plan B, (laughs) go down. (laughs) I don't know, but but I'll know that that you haven't given me them into your hand. And so he gets up the thing with his his armor bearer at tow. And all of a sudden the Philistines go, oh, look at these little Hebrews. Look at the little sissies. They're coming up out of their holes finally. (laughs) Ha ha, why don't you come up here and we're going to teach you something. They were mocking, condescending. They were glorying in their position because they had the numbers, they had the advantage. And so Jonathan says, thank you, Lord. You've given them into my, into my hand. And Jonathan begins to dispatch 20 trained soldiers, trained and armed soldiers. And he's going there skillfully and hacking and dodging and wiping out. And as they fall, I I think this is fascinating, the armor bearer finished them off. And what happened after he dispatched, and again, I say Hollywood descended, that's amazing. 20, 20 to one. And and he, he demolishes them. And he did it in such a way that all of a sudden the people go, what is happening? How are these people getting, uh, getting so taken out? And all of a sudden there was confusion and, and people started running and it, it caused the whole army, not just this garrison, the whole army to start running away in fear and confusion. That's the story. That's what Jonathan did. Now... It's very clear at the end of this text in verse uh, 23 that God provided a clear victory through the relentless faith of Jonathan. Now, there is one verse that I want to read that I didn't read on purpose that I want to bring your attention to, and that's back up in verse 6. Back up in verse 6. Here's what Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Come, let us go over the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. This, underline that verse. This actually tells us exactly what drove Jonathan. This is what drove Jonathan to risk, to stand alone, to move to action when everyone else stayed seated. 
Jonathan moved forward when everyone else stood fast. He trusted when the circumstances were bleak and even his own family, even his own family wouldn't move forward with him. See, faith, listen, folks, faith is not dependent and based on circumstances or even family situations. Jesus even said, who does he divide when he came? He divides friendships sometimes and sometimes even family. Because Jonathan was willing to stand firm and move forward even when his family did not. This was not youthful impetuousness. This was childlike faith. Notice that he had a clear conviction. Here's what he said. I have a clear, he had a clear conviction about God. Nothing can keep God from saving. He had a clear conviction about who God is. That's why we study the Old and the New Testament. We want a clear understanding of our God. That led to the second, which produced great expectations of God. He had a conviction of who God was, and so he expected God to do what he promised, and he knew God used normal means to accomplish that. When he says he will use many or few, he's going to use servants to accomplish that. It's not just God snaps his fingers and things happen. God decrees them, he moves, and then we, we move obediently from there. It reminds of us of William Carey, who launched a generation of missions in India with the mantra and message, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Jonathan wasn't here. He wasn't impetuous. He wasn't saying, I'm the most skilled climber or the most skilled soldier. Let me add him. I'm not, give me one, you know, one sword and I'll take out the army. He wasn't trusting his own prowess. He was dependent on God's acting on his behalf. But because God would act, it caused the hatching of the daring plan. He believed that God would deliver. He believed so much that he was willing to move and risk his life. Now notice that the text says this. I have the ESV. In the ESV it says, it may be that God will work. Do you see that in verse 6? It may be that God will work. It could also be translated, I think, in the New King James, maybe the NASB, perhaps, perhaps God will work. That's really significant. Perhaps God will work. It, it signals that he was not presuming on God or leveraging God. This was not some cosmic divine quid pro quo that he was playing out with God. It wasn't, he wasn't playing a game. He, he was sincerely saying, I'm going to step out in faith, and, and I'm trusting that God's going to act. But he may not. He may not. He wasn't, he wasn't demanding of God. He was trusting God. There's a big difference. Misplaced religiosity tries to leverage God. If I do this... We don't have to state it, but this is what we believe sometimes. If I do this, God must do this for me. Charlatan preachers, even today, and false gospels have big markets for this kind of vulgarity, where they tell people if they trust the Lord and send their money, that's a big one, they will be healed. They will have success. Their marriages will work out. Their businesses will, will flourish. That, that they'll get out of debt. That, I mean, that's, that is... That is from the pit of hell, those things. People play, play and practice religion trying to leverage God, trying to, trying to trick God into giving them more. Oh, I'll just send money and he'll make me rich. And then, and then charlatan leaders start playing on the fears of people and the misplaced trust of people to get themselves rich. Religion like this is damnable and detestable but it is the perhaps that keeps us both courageous to move beyond the norm and entrust ourselves to God for the results. Here's what I mean. The perhaps is what drove Queen Esther. Do you remember Queen Esther, who when her, her uncle said, perhaps you have been put in this position as a queen for such a time as this to save our people from the, the hazardous plans of Haman. And you remember what... What Esther says, I'm going to go and I'm going to tell the king, I'm going to request to the king, even though it's against the law, and what? If I perish, I perish. I'm not even saying it's going to work. I'm saying I'm going to trust that it's going to work, and I'm going to do what I'm called to do, and if, if it means my life, it means my life. How about Daniel? Daniel 1, verse 9. 
He was in a, in a foreign land as an exa- exile. He goes, I am not going to eat. I'm going to commit myself. I'm going to resolve not to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine. And he did that at his own peril. He could have died. He could have lost influence, but he was, he was convinced of these things. How about Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2? Epaphroditus, who hazarded, it says in Philippians 2.30, he hazarded his, his life. He put his life on the line for a simple thing of bringing a message to Saul in, in, in uh, bearing up what, what the Philippian church couldn't do for him. It doesn't mean, it doesn't always mean the dramatic. Uh, honestly, this kind of faith, relentless faith, has to be in the mundane. It's not the dramatic, it's the ordinary. It's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust the Lord. I'm gonna do what's right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out in faith. And if God blesses that in the way I think he can, then amen and amen. And if he doesn't, and it doesn't go well for me, and it just means that I'm gonna have to suffer or be persecuted, then if I do, I do. If I perish, I perish. Each of these could have died or their plan couldn't have worked, and they still would have been right. Faith recognizes its degree of ignorance and knows it has to read the transcript of the divine decrees for most situations. And this should enhance our ability to walk by faith, not cancel it. Well, third, relentless faith trusts God, not religious acts. Relentless faith trusts God, not in religious acts. Acts. And, so, and so Jonathan has this victory. I said three different ways. It says uh, the Philistine army was, was running and they were very much confused. They were all over the place. And this should have been a great day of victory. This should have been another day of rejoicing, another ticker tape parade that Israel would have put on. And all Saul or the rest of the army had to do was do mop-up duty. God was doing the work. God had created the victory. In fact, the text says that all those who were in hiding started coming out of hiding and started fighting. Amen and amen. But I want to show you that Saul kept doubling down on the wrong things. He kept, I don't know if you've known anybody in your life that does this. It's like, man, you always make the wrong choice. Like choosing two, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you do. I'm going to do the opposite. Whatever you do, would you, would you invest your money? I'm going to do the opposite. And I'll probably be right. This was Saul at this point. So, so as, as Israel's gaining victory in verse 19, Saul goes, you know what I'm going to do? Ah, victory's upon us. We have it. Let's bring out the ark. Bring out the ark. Yes, Ahijah, Ahijah, bring out the ark. Yes. Did that go well the last time they brought ark, the ark into battle? Read a little history. Did the ark help them? Or that, that didn't help them at all. And in fact, he did this, which again, if he's waiting on the Lord, that'd be one thing, but he does it only long enough to where he sees actually the victory keeps happening without him and he even stops. He goes, he goes, take your hands off. Let's, let's do something else. He wasn't even convinced and convicted enough to do that. And then look, look with me at verse 24. This should have been a great day of victory. And look at what what 24 says. The men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul laid an oath on the people saying, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, evening and I am avenged of my enemies. It should have been a great day of victory, but Saul wasn't leading them, and the people were hard-pressed, just the same wording as it was in chapter 13. And in, in, it just, the same thing, the same pattern kept happening, and Saul doubled down on his religiosity. He doubled down, not in trusting the Lord by conviction, but trusting the functional religious things instead of him. And so he goes, then I'll make a vow. And you could say, man, making a vow, that makes you pretty, pretty religious. Making a vow, man, that, that's, that's a big deal. Now, by the way, uh, no person has to make a vow. A vow is voluntary. If Ecclesiastes 5 says, you don't have to make a vow, but if you make a vow, what does it say? You better pay it. If you make a vow, you better pay it. God doesn't force you to do it. If you make a vow to get married... You pay it. It's not duty, I'm not saying, you know, but I say like, like it's serious. And you go, oh, it's just a, a verbal contract. No, God takes these things seriously. 
And so he makes this vow, thinking, thinking that somehow this would do something for him. Listen to what uh, one commentator said about this. Saul gives the impression that he felt that he was supposed to be religious and observe certain conventions at appropriate times, but really had not, he had no deep convictions of his own. He used religion as opposed to a living personal faith in the Lord. And so my question with, the, with all of this, and maybe we'll have to, we'll get in close to conclude here, and this is important. It, it, life tends to reveal, or, or your actions and, and your life tend to reveal what you really believe. And here is what Saul really believed. Saul didn't know uh, what his life was all about, and so he kept drifting from one thing or another. He kept trying different things, where Jonathan was absolutely convinced that God was in control and his life was gonna reflect it. Jonathan didn't pray, he didn't act trying to leverage God. He prayed and he acted because he knew his God. Far too many people in our culture play religion to try to placate the Lord. They go to church even though they don't really believe it. It's why they're bored at church. If you're bored at church, that's, that's, that's on you. We like to think, if I'm bored at church, something's wrong with the church. Spice it up, baby. Like, give me something. Make me feel at church. Stop. If you ain't feeling coming in, nothing I'm going to do is going to make you feel anything. In fact, I always say I'm a much better preacher to those who are spirit-filled than those who are not. I can preach the same message and certain people are like, man, that was awesome. And the other section's sleeping in the corner. Does that mean I need to change? Maybe. Maybe I got to talk louder. <laughs> Maybe. But listen, religiosity is saying I'm going to go through the motions because I think going through the motions is going to earn me, gain me, get me something from God. And do you know the dead giveaway? Sometimes the dead giveaway between am I, am I functioning out of relentless faith and convictional realities of what I really believe versus not is, is you get bored very quickly and you stop very quickly. You hear on Sunday, ah, I should be reading my Bible more. I should, I should read through my Bible in a year. I should do these things. And you try for a little while and how long does it last? Very, very little time. You look at your life, you pray very little. You'll do the showy things. You'll do the big thing. Oh, service, I'm there. Oh, uh, if it fits in my schedule, I'm there, but it doesn't reflect the rest of your life. It's why we have this hypocritical version of Christianity is because we have people living like Saul, not like Jonathan. We don't, we don't do this out of a conviction saying, I want to know my God, so I'm going to discipline myself to know him. I'm going to discipline myself in prayer and the word and corporate worship and, and all the other things that go along with that. I'm going to discipline myself to do that because I want to know and please my God. And out of that, I'm going to act. I'm going to act out of that conviction instead of acting like I care. Instead of acting the part, instead of going through the motions. And if anything from this text that we'll conclude next week is that. Are you convinced of the things that you say you believe? Or are you going through the motions? And I know you, you say you believe them because the songs we sang, you can't sing them. You can't sing them and, and come to grips with them and then walk away from here and go, ah, I don't really believe that. I'll sing them again next week, but it doesn't affect my, my daily walk. That's the difference. And what Saul, what it produced in Saul were these over and over, these foolish decisions that were exposed in what he really believed. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for these reminders in Old Testament history of things that are actually so relevant to us today. The fact that we are faced with the same kinds of decisions, not, not the dramatic ones of 
climbing up a rock and killing 20 soldiers. We're faced every day with, are we gonna trust you and believe in you and do what you call us to do even when it's hard out of conviction? Or are we gonna function thinking that religion is just something nice to do that we leverage you in? I pray, Lord, that we'd be people of conviction, of relentless faith, that we would be committed to knowing you, to glorifying you, to making you known, and out of that, Lord, that we'd be willing to take steps out in faith and live for your glory, and that we would take a step out in faith when no one else does. Individually, as families, even as a church, that we would continue to stand firm, even if, even if other churches don't, that we would do that even if our family does not. that we'd be convinced and convicted and trusting you the whole time. And Lord, I do ask that we would be like Jonathan, who at the end of the story is confronted and he says, if I need to die, I need to die. If I need to risk my life, I need to risk my life. That that wouldn't be in these, only in these dramatic ways. That'd be in a daily, daily way that we are willing to die to ourselves each and every day to live for your glory. So thank you for this morning, Lord. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.